We have a backup of our database taken on Windows, but we would like to restore it to our new Linux server. Is that possible? And this, this is a, a very common requirement we're seeing nowadays as people modernize their hardware or they're basically you know, making a, a change of direction. A lot of people used to have their Oracle databases running on, what was the term we used to use called, I think we used to call it Big Iron. Uh, the concept of, you know, people had big Sun boxes, big HP boxes, big IBM boxes, and they're still very, very popular for customers who have those very demanding needs. But as the world has changed and Intel machines, and if you've ever owned a modern Mac, you know that, you know, modern CPUs, whatever the architecture, are just mine blowingly uh, fast nowadays. So a lot of people are being able to move their stuff to um, different platforms. And the question is, is it a hard thing to do? So let's see. Well, let's talk about it. To talk about moving databases between platforms, we have to talk about something that actually is unrelated to really Oracle at all, and that is the concept of endians. And there's a link there if you want to really dig into endians. But the easy way of describing endians, um, the term itself, interesting enough, I, I googled for where the term came from. They suspect the original term came from the book Gulliver's Travels. Now, if you're unfamiliar with Gulliver's Travels, it's a book about where Gulliver travels to various places and People are very small, people are very big. He's a giant in one place, he's a little person in the other. But in, I can't remember exactly where, but in one of the parts of Gulliver's Travels, there's a, a strong divide between two groups of people. Some people eat their egg starting at the little end and other people start eating their egg at the big end. And that's where the first term, the first recorded term they think they found, little endian and big endian have come from, even though they're now commonly used in computer terminology, it came from Gulliver's Travels. Which end of the egg do you start with? In computer terms, it's a little bit more sophisticated than uh, where you crack the shell. If we look at an Endian example, you can see a big Endian there on the left is if I've got a 32-bit integer. This integer is 0a, 0b, 0c, 0d. How do we lay that out in memory? And big Endian is uh, probably closest to what we'd think of, of English writing in the sense that we lay it out for lack of a better term, left to right. So we take from the left the 0a, and that goes into our first byte of memory. Then 0b goes in the next byte, 0c the third byte, and 0d the fourth byte. A little endian architecture is the opposite. If I have a 32-bit um, integer of 0a, 0b, 0c, 0d, what happens is we grab the d part first, and then we go the c, then b, then a. But what does this mean? Well, some machines store the information in big endian form and others store it in little endian form. So the data out on disk, you know, on one platform to another might be actually totally different. And, and we can model that uh, with a little bit of SQL. I'm using an MS Windows machine here with just the standard consolas font. And so it doesn't show things like emojis or any kind of extended characters. Uh, so and then take my word for it that character 9702 is actually just a white bullet point. It's one of the extended characters, but my machine shows it as just a little squiggly line because it's good old DOS command prompt, which doesn't have that kind of um, code page by default. If we actually dump that out on this Windows machine, the dump returns us this, 37 and 230. Now, that's a little bit cryptic. That's how it actually stores this multi-byte character. Where does 37 and 230 come from? You might be thinking if it's 9702. What we're doing is we're using effectively one byte gives you a power of two to the two to the eight, so 256. So if we actually do some mathematics here, if we truncate 9702 by 256, we get 37. So 9702 contains 37 multiples of 256 with a little bit of remainder. So if we look at the mod of that, we get 230. And that's how we store that multi-byte character. We store 37 and 230 because it's 37 times 256 plus 230 gives us out two bytes. That's where we know how those two numbers come from. Let's return them in hexadecimal, and you'll see why that's useful when we run the next piece of script. Those two values, 37,250 in hexadecimal, are 25 and E6. Let's now dump out that character, 9702, which we know is two hex bytes, in little endian format. So I'm saying convert this string to UTF-16 in little endian mode. And we can see in little endian format, it comes out as E625, 37 followed by 230, which looks just like we saw the dump before. If I say, let's convert it to a different uh, endian, this is big endian, which is 1016, 
we can see what happens is that same character would be stored flipped. It would be stored 25 first than E6. So on some platforms, it would be stored 25 E6. On other platforms, it would be stored E6 25, which is how it here is on Windows. To prove how it's stored in Windows, if I create a table storing effectively 9702, I can actually say, okay, let's now go do a block dump. What's the row ID? Using that row ID for that one row, go find the block number and the file number. I go find that and I'll dump it out to a trace file. On Windows, to flush that trace file out, I have to actually disconnect. So we'll disconnect, but this is the command I want to run. I'm going to extract where the column information is in my block dump. And we can see, I was alluding to the fact already, that on the Windows machine, I'm storing it as 25E6, like we saw in the little Indian. You don't have to go around doing block dumps in order to work out what Indian platform you have in front of you. Uh, we actually provide a V-Dollar view to do it for you. If you select from VDollar transportable platform, because this view was originally designed to talk about how you were going to cope with moving data sets between different platforms, it'll tell you. But here's the big ones, and as it generally, you know, maybe this is why we call them big iron, it's your AIX, your IBM, et cetera, et cetera. And your little ones are generally things like your Intel architectures, et cetera. Here's the same screened up now, just back in the slides. And if we look, this person said, I want to go from Windows to Linux, and they are both little endian. So one would imagine that out there in data file land, those two data files, perhaps with the exception of some header information, which indicates the platform they're on, the data itself should be stored literally the same. Theoretically, you'd think you should be able to restore a Linux backup to a Windows machine or a Windows backup to a Linux machine. And I thought, well, let's give it a go or let's see how you would actually do it. I've got a database here, which is currently running, I think. I've connected a SysDBA and it's running on this laptop here. So it is a Microsoft Windows. It's a little Indian database. Now I'm gonna shut it down for reasons I'll never know. Shut down a board on Windows always takes a little bit of time, but I'm gonna shut it down because I'm gonna try restore a Linux backup into this Windows database. That's the plan here. So this is the database as it currently exists. It's got, as you'd expect, got control files, ready logs, and I've kept it as small as possible because obviously I don't wanna waste your time when we do the restore. This is the first thing I'm gonna do. The database is called db19s, and I've just wiped out that directory. I've just removed all the database files so this database has ceased to exist. And we can see it's all gone. So that's obviously a bit of a catastrophe for this database. Now, rather than show you a, back a backup running, which obviously would take some time, I took a backup off a Linux machine. Um, I just kept the output. So please, I'm not trying to you know, hoodwink you here. This is the legitimate output. You can see I took a database with four data files. They were, you, know, you can see their Linux file names, and this is the name of the backup. It's backup 021, et cetera, et cetera, all just in a backup set. That was on a Linux machine. I simply copied that backup over to a temp directory here on my Windows machine, and we're going to use that to see if we can restore into this Windows database, this Linux backup. I copied it to my one of my X drives here on my machine. So it's uh, just an external drive and it's a two and a half gigabyte backup and you can see the names generally match up. So please take my word for it. This is a Linux database backup. So the first thing I do, I'm going to start up my database in no mount mode because there's no control files. So it's got nothing to work with. So I just have to start it up in no mount mode. There we go. I've started up my database. It's no mount, it's just a small SGA. So what do I do? I now go into RMAN. And this is the syntax you'll see. I'm restoring, but rather than just restore a data file, I say restore from platform, it's a Linux platform. It's a foreign data file, it's not a Windows data file. And I give it the name. So I'm saying get data file one, that's my system table space, and get it into this new name, my Windows name, from the backup set. So this command for each of these files takes care of finding the backup file in there, which in this case would have been a Linux file, and restoring it into my destination file name that I've nominated here. So it's done system, it's done users, it's done sysauth, it's doing my undo one. That's why I tried to keep my database nice and small so this wouldn't take too long, and it's done. So I've now copied four Linux data files out of the backup set into Windows destinations. And nothing, no conversion should have been required because they were both little endian. And there I have my four files. Now my database isn't ready to go yet because I don't have a control file yet. I need to write a control file. Just for simplicity, both these databases are running in no archive log mode, so it's a cold backup. I could do this with a hot backup as well, but that would just require database recovery at the end of the exercise. 
So I'm just doing set database to the database name. The database name wasn't db19s under Linux. Reset the logs, no archive log, and I simply tell the database where my data files are. And then I open database reset logs. And hopefully, if we don't get any Aura 600 errors, voila, my database has opened. It was a Linux backup that's been restored into a Windows machine, and I could have done vice versa. I add a temporary table space because they get erased when you do a full database restore. And obviously, to validate that this database has been fully recovered, we do the time-honored technique of just making sure we can select from dual. <laughs> At which point we say, yep, everything's fine, we're good to go. That's about the easiest you can do. There's actually, it's very quick, it's just a copy, you know, mention of extracting data files from a backup. Uh, you actually can do cross-platform, cross-endian operations as well. If you're migrating from, say, AIX to Linux, or you're migrating from, say, Solaris to Windows, or Windows to Solaris, or anything, where you have to eat a difference between big endian and little endian format, the same principles apply. The only difference really is that obviously we have to have to manipulate those data files because they really have to go swap every single byte. And if you check your Armand documentation, you'll see as well as a restore, we have a convert data file command, which literally that you simply type in, I want to convert it and you nominate the new platform. It works out what platform, what that means in terms of Endian, and you can do the same thing.